Hello, my friends, and welcome to the parish of St. Anne's here in Toronto, Ontario. My name is Father Don Byers, and I serve as the priest and pastor of this parish. And I'm so glad that you once again joined us for our weekly worship video for this weekend as we pray, listen, and worship together. My friends, whether you're new to our faith community or perhaps been a longtime member, I hope that you find this time meaningful and helpful to you. And as always, please know that I'm here for you. If there's ever anything you need, you may contact me and know that I will pray and support you in whatever way I can. My friends, as we begin our time of prayer together, let us join together in saying the opening call out. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were so sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Listen for the leading of the Spirit.
from the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus said to the people, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of Christ. My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm sure many of us at one time or another have heard or used the phrase, you are what you eat. First made popular by the 19th century French author and Thelemy Brillant Savarin when he wrote, tell me what you eat and I will tell you what you are. The expression intended to challenge us to con carefully consider our dietary habits. It was believed that there was a connect correlation between food and our mental and physical health. Whether you agree with that or not, the phrase is worth pondering and not simply from the point of dietary habits and physical health, but also spiritual well-being. Although most writers would attribute the origin of the idiom to Roland Severin, a much earlier writer made a similar connection in the early 5th century. The early Christian bishop and now acclaimed church father, St. Augustine of Hippo, first suggested the connection between what we eat and who we are in an Easter sermon to newly baptized Christians. Speaking of the Eucharistic elements of bread and wine, Augustine tells the newly baptized that if you receive them well, you are yourselves what you receive. In other words, you become the very thing that you eat. Augustine yearned for the new Christians to become Christ and to live in love and charity with all Christians and all God's people. His belief was that we become Christ in our reception of the Eucharist was deeply rooted in the scriptures and remains a prominent Christian teaching even to our own day. Thus we have this pairing this Sunday of St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians with the Gospel of John's account of Jesus' bread of life teaching, the compilers of the lectionary, the book appointed of appointed scripture readings for each Sunday, want to stress to those of us hearing the scriptures that our reception of the Eucharist radically transforms us and our relationship with God and with all people. This is a point worth considering. We celebrate the Eucharist not only to encounter the living God, Jesus Christ in the flesh, but also to open our eyes to Christ's presence among us in our neighbor, including those with whom we struggle most. I think we Christians are 
often tempted to see our reception of the Eucharist as a personal act, something that Jesus gives to us individually. That belief is understandable if we simply take Jesus, Jesus' words as they are. As we heard today in the Gospel, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. On the surface, Jesus' words gives us the impression that he gives himself to us personally to sustain and nourish us as we make our journey of faith. We could easily reduce our reception of the Eucharist to a very personal and individual experience, a me and Jesus sort of thing. It is striking that the Gospel writer John, who relates to us Jesus' bread of life discourse, and who could arguably be the most Eucharistic gospel of the four gospels, doesn't give us the words of institution in his account of the Last Supper, but focuses on Jesus' teaching that we should love one another as he has loved us. John makes clear that our reception of the bread of life demands that we humbly, that we humble ourselves and love and serve the least among us. Yet I think we have sometimes forgotten that our celebration and reception of the Eucharist demands a radical change in us. Prior to the pandemic, I was often taken aback by the way some would take the Eucharistic bread and wine, only to turn around and treat their neighbor with utmost disregard and disrespect. It was as if our celebration of the Eucharist and encounter with Jesus in word and sacrament had no impact on the way we live our life. Apparently, this has always been a challenge for us Christians. St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians offers a severe warning to the Christian community in Corinth. Paul writes, whoever therefore eats the bread drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of our Lord. From what we can gather in his letter, the Christian community in Corinth was greatly divided, and some members of the community were treating each other with great disrespect. Paul reminds his friends to treat one another with love and charity. Our lives must reflect and embody the unity and love of Christ. Be imitators of God, St. Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. In the past few months, I've heard countless people express to me their deep longing to once again come together and encounter Christ in each other and in the Eucharistic bread and wine. As awful as the pandemic was, I think our time apart has renewed within us a deep longing and appreciation for the things that are important to us. Perhaps this time of absence has shown us how important the Eucharist is for us and for the life of the church. We need to gather as one body around the holy table and to eat of the very bread that nourishes us and forms us into the image and likeness of God. As we gather again in a few days for in-person worship, I pray we never forget to not only share in the sacrament of the altar, but to live as Christ to all, always seeking unity and holy love and charity with all God's people, particularly those persons who often go unnoticed and forgotten. Augustine said as much to his friends a century ago, his words to the newly baptized are worth pondering, and I invite you to listen as I close with a few lines from his Easter sermon. Augustine's words are just as important for us to hear as they were for those newly Christian 
baptized so long ago. Augustine writes, in this loaf of bread, you are given clearly to understand how much you should love unity. I mean, was that loaf made from one grain? Weren't there many grains of wheat? But before they came into the loaf, they were all separate. They were joined together by means of water after a certain amount of pounding and crushing. Unless wheat is ground, after all, and moistened with water, it can't possibly get into the shape which is called bread. In the same way you too were being ground and pounded as it were by the humiliation of fasting. Then came baptism, and you were, in a manner of speaking, moistened with water in order to be shaped into bread. But it's not yet bread without fire to break it. So what does this fire represent? That's the chrism, the anointing, oil, the fire feeder you see, is the sacrament of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
In the time after Pentecost, may the breath of the Holy Spirit enliven and renew our parish as we welcome our pastor, Don Byers. Like the apostles, may we at St. Anne's be open to fresh challenges and to new ways of living our commitment to each other. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us continue to pray for those who have safeguarded our lives during the pandemic. Let us pray that vaccines will be available for all, both in Canada and throughout the world. May the Holy Spirit inspire us to find creative paths toward a just economic recovery for our city. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray to the Holy Spirit that we may discern her gifts given to us for the building of God's kingdom. May the flame of creativity inspire artists in every field, men and women of science, farmers, office workers, and laborers. May all work be blessed in God's eyes. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the mystical body of Christ, pray that we may embrace every race, religion, and nation as beloved members of God's kingdom. Let us pray for the leaders of Canada and of the world and for the work of peace and reconciliation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the apostles received the gifts of tongues, let us ask the Holy Spirit for the gift of listening to the stories which haunt our city in the words of immigrants and refugees, of those without homes, and those who bear painful emotional burdens. Let us listen and respond with care and attention. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us contemplate with awe and wonder the mystery of creation, from the starry heavens to the humble life of plants. In the season of rebirth, let us pray for all nesting birds and animals with their young. May their revelation of God's love inspire us to protect and care for the natural world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
Hello from your St. Anne's Wardens team. The main news this week is that we've been working with Father Don, our Treasurer David Gard, and the staff team of Mervyn, Mary Lou, and Julie to prepare for an August 15th return to on-site worship service in the church. We'll be following the COVID restriction guidelines as we did last summer during our opening period. Chief among these is registering your contact details in advance of arrival via the Eventbrite link that we'll be sending out or doing so at the Gladstone entrance before passing through the church doors. Earlier this week, we had a live stream Zoom practice to ensure the technology is ready for a live stream broadcast of the Eucharist, sermon and solistic singing in two Sundays time. Thus, you can make the choice of participating from your home or returning to the full worship experience in our beautiful St. Anne's Church building. Well, thanks, Mark. Yeah, let's take our cue from the slogan we often hear these days of building back better. We want to move forward to restore the richness of our in-church worship while retaining the good aspects we've experienced with remote worship. The plan includes recording a preamble video for viewing before Sunday service, live streaming in the church worship, convening a short interactive fellowship session afterwards for the engagement of online participants, and posting a worship service summary version for later viewing. We have the volunteers we need for Sunday, August 15th, such as greeters, servers, readers, singers, sound and video operators, and a Zoom deacon. However, we're going to need a roster of ongoing volunteers after this, so please consider how you can contribute. I look forward to seeing many of you this Sunday as your Zoom deacon or the last in our series of 10 a.m. Eucharist plus 1030 Zoom fellowship discussion. God bless. Bye-bye. My friends, once again, I'm glad that you were able to join us for our worship video and to spend some time in worship and prayer with us. Know that everyone is welcomed here at St. Anne's. My friends, a few announcements that I'd like to share with you. I invite you to join us again tomorrow, August 8th, for our celebration of Holy Eucharist on Zoom at 10 o'clock. Afterwards, at 10.30, we'll stay in that same Zoom link and share in conversation, prayer, and, and reflection at 10.30 again tomorrow on Zoom. So join us either at 10 o'clock for Eucharist or and at 10.30 for our Zoom conversation, prayer, and reflection. My friends, I am so excited to share with you once again that we will be reopening our wonderful church for in-person worship a week from now on Sunday, August 15th for our celebration of Holy Eucharist at 10.30 a.m. All are welcome. It's going to be an amazing time to be able to come together. And for me personally, I can't wait to be able to see you, to finally be able to meet you in person, to be able to pray with you. And as I said in my sermon, get to encounter Christ, not only in the Eucharistic bread and wine, but to also meet Christ in you. So my friends, I do invite you to join us, not only tomorrow for our prayer and worship on Zoom at 10 o'clock for Eucharist and 10.30 for our discussion, but to also join us in person on Sunday, August 15th. Now, to get you ready for a return to in-person worship and to help you remain safe and healthy while you're here, we're going to release a wonderful video that Thomas, our videographer made, along with some of our wonderful parishioners to show you our custom for during this time of pandemic, to give you little tips about how we come into church, how you prepare for it, how you register, what we ask that you do while you're here to ensure that all are safe. So stay tuned this week for that wonderful video because we'll have much to share with you in that. And again, my friends, join us again tomorrow at 10 o'clock for our celebration of Eucharist on Zoom. Details for that are on our website at saintanne.ca. That same link will be used for our Zoom conversation and prayer at 10.30. And as I said earlier, join us for our first Sunday of in-person worship on Sunday, August 15th at 10.30 a.m. May God bless you, may God keep you, and may God let God's face shine upon you always. God bless and take care.